Hello and welcome back to another episode of the Elian Road podcast. Uh, today on the episode we'll chat about the losses against Man United and Newcastle last week, answer some questions from the GPG and look ahead to Wolves away this weekend. Today we're back in the studio and I'm joined by Niall in the studio. Niall, how are you doing mate? I'm good, how are you? Yeah, not too bad, not too bad. Get straight into United then. Not really much to shout about in that first half. I tweeted after the game um, that we showed them way too much respect in the first half, especially considering we trounced them 4-0 earlier in the season. Mm. What, did, what did you make of that first half performance? Um, I thought it was a very poor performance. Obviously, we did our usual low block. Um, I think the problem is if we go and aggress- um, press them high up the pitch aggressively, Rashford on the last man against Janssen and... Was it Roslev playing right back, mm-hmm. right wing back? Could have been a recipe for disaster that. Mm. Um, so yeah, I, I can understand why people wanted us to maybe press up high up the pitch. Um, but at the same time, you know, we only lost 1-0. Um, it could have been a lot worse. Um, and yeah, it's just one of those things. It's Man United away. You can't really, you can't really get too carried away with a loss there, in my I, opinion. I reckon though, like... With the way that we pressed them up high earlier in the earlier in the season in the four mm. 0 and we got so much joy doing it. I know it's Man United away, and I know that we can't go, be going there expecting to win. But I was confident before the game, just purely based on mm. how well we did in the first. We blew them away in that first half, yeah. and it just seems like it seems like it was an opportunity miss for me. Um, I know I know it's Man United away, but yeah, in the, again in the second half, not too much to shout about apart from that. Kevin Shard a chance. When he came on, I thought he changed the game. Well worthy of his start against Newcastle on the weekend. Um, but he has to be burying that one-on-one, doesn't he? Yeah, no. I mean, he's still very raw. You can see glimpses of his quality, but obviously he's got a lot to work on finishing being one of them. Um, but yeah, I think it was probably a harder chance than it looked because De Gea was coming out quickly and he probably probably should have chipped the keeper. Mm. Um, I don't think he got the contact he wanted to. Yeah. But yeah, that was a good chance, but... Um, you know, it's just one of those things that... Yeah, it's almost like he had too much time on it. Yeah, exactly. I yeah. think uh, if he'd have made his mind up a bit... I've, I've watched the chance back so many times, as you do with Brentford games. <laughs> but but if, he, if, he, if he kind of picks a corner before he goes for the chip, I think he's probably going to he's probably gonna score. But yeah. And Buemo, I thought, had another bit of a, a shocker. It was so weird because, you know, in the last few games, I thought he's been particularly poor considering how good he was in the previous few games. Mm. Seems like the final final piece to his game, for me, is that consistency. Because when he's up for it, he's, he's so good, isn't mm, yeah. he? You know, it's, it's one of those things, but that's been the case since he first joined us. Mm-hmm. Obviously, he had a great first season with us. I think he scored about, was it 14 or 15? Mm-hmm. Something like that. Um, in the championship. In the championship, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and he's still kind of got those the same weaknesses in his game that he had back then. Um, I, I like Mbwemo. He really pisses me off. <laughs> re- like no other Brentford player pisses me off as much as he does because I see the potential he has. Uh-huh. And um, you know when we signed him, it was a whole big deal for us because it was quite a lot of money, around six million pounds. Mm-hmm. Um, apparently he was supposed to go to Marseille, and then that deal fell through, so he came to Brentford. And obviously at the time that was a massive deal for us because we, we're, you know, at that time we were a little old Brentford still. Mm-hmm. Um, so uh, uh, I can see him going in the summer, to be honest. Yeah. Um, you know, the rumours of Napoli wanting him. Yeah. Um, I can see a move like that. I think he will flourish wherever he goes. Um, I, I think we can upgrade on him. Um, but yeah, no, he's such a frustrating player. Yeah, he is. Yeah. Uh, I think I, I wanted to talk a little bit about the away end that day. Mm. Um, lots of home fans. There was a home fan sat next to me. Uh, well, not sat, he was, stu- he was stood next to me. And just the away end was just so flat. It, it was... We've talked about it before on the podcast, but sometimes you go to these big games, and for some reason, for whatever reason, the the atmosphere just is just completely shot. Um, there was a question on the GPG talking about home fans in the in the away end. Oh no, no, no! There was a question on the GPG talking about away fans in the home end. But that day, it just I don't know what the solution is to be honest. Because when we go to the thing is, if it, if it had been a Saturday, I don't think we would have had that problem. But because yeah. they rearranged it, so many fans couldn't go. Yeah. So it becomes difficult. Yeah. Honestly, I'd rather us take 800 actual <laughs> Brentford fans rather than the 2,000 we get. But you know, it's just one of those things of being in the Premier League. It's such a small club. We're not going to take. We're not. We're not going to fill out that allocation. Yeah. Up north and in midweek. So. Yeah, 100. percent We'll go on to Newcastle then. Dominated them in the first half. Uh, rightly led at halftime, courtesy of Ivan Tony at the second time of asking. Um, what went wrong in that second half? Um. <sighs> wow. Um, I think Newcastle 
obviously Eddie Howe had a talk with him at half time. Um, I think the first 10 minutes, they just started so quickly. Um, and that's kind of a thing with Brentford. When teams start quickly, I think that's kind of been a problem for us. Mm-hmm. Um, you look at Villa away earlier this season. Yeah. Um, I think their goals were came in like... The first 15 minutes. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, we just never seem to get going. When the team plays with intensity against us, we can't really match it. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know why that is the case. Maybe we don't have like workhorses in midfield, which is why which Newcastle have, mm-hmm. and where they dominated us. Um, but yeah, I, I still think that we deserved something out of the game. Maybe I think we deserved a win, if I'm being honest. I don't think Newcastle did too much. They just um, had those two moments, didn't they, really? Yeah, exactly. Um, I think another day we would have got something. But again, just one of those days, you know, it's the Premier League and they're third in the table. Yeah, yeah. And they have quality, quality players yeah. um, who can win games just like that. And that's what they did. So. Mm. What's your thoughts on the Rico Henry penalty incident in the in the, in the first half? I've seen a lot of people saying it wasn't a pen. I, I'm, mm. I think it was soft, very soft. I think it's a pen. <laughs> <laughs> I said I said it was Stonewall at the time, but maybe not Stonewall. Um, I think who, who was the defender that? Um, well, it was Rico Henry, and it was Isaac that went into Rico. Yeah, the Rico Henry. Yeah. I think it's just one of those things where if you if raise it, your foot that yeah. high, I think and anywhere else on the pitch that would have yeah been yeah. a foul. So you know, it's one of those where you've seen it given either way. Yeah. Um, but yeah, for me, penalty. But yeah, mm. another great performance from uh, Kevin Sharder. Do you reckon he keeps his place against Wolves on oh, Saturday? Absolutely. Yeah. He he gives us that something we've kind of been lacking mm. since maybe even Ben Rama left. You know that kind of unpredictability yeah. and his pace is frightening. Yeah, no, he's uh, so quick. That, that run he went on for um, the missed penalty. Mm-hmm. Um, that was something else. Well, when he touches it, takes it down and just yeah. skins his man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. I know it was like probably Dan Byrne or something, but, <laughs> but uh, yeah, no, he's he's going to be a quality player for us. I'm very excited about him. Yeah, over the over those three games from from Brighton United, uh, Brighton United and Newcastle, what what were you expecting to come out of those games with points wise? Um, one point. You reckon? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm a pessimist, so <laughs> Brighton away, tough, tough game. I know, paper. I know, but yeah. I just I, I really. I, I know that people are going to slate me for this because they're like, you know, we're Brentford, we've come up from mm. League Two and we're in the big leagues. But I really think that United game was especially a missed opportunity. And I think if we beat, if we beat United, we get something out of the Newcastle game as well. But, you know, out of the, out of the three games, are you, are you now thinking, I know that you never thought Europe was on, but are you now thinking it's dead in the water? Uh, yeah, kind of, because I, I just feel like Chelsea um, are going to start winning again just because of the quality they have. Mm-hmm. Um I just think it's too much of a it's, it's too much of a hard ask for us. Um, I think there is a chance if we get results in the next couple of games, if we get two wins in the next couple of games, then maybe. But um, you know, we end the season at home to Man City as well, um, so it's not really a dead rubber for them if they're still yeah, you know, exactly. playing for the title. And even if they're not, it's still <coughs> going to be a tough game because you know Guardiola never wants to lose. Mm. Um, so yeah, I've always thought it was unlikely. Now I'd say it's very unlikely. Um, but yeah, I've seen stranger things happen. Mm. I'm not the biggest fan, I mentioned to you off camera, I'm not the biggest fan of Thomas Frank coming out in his post-match interviews and coming across a little bit salty when he when he says Isaac's a £63 million pound player. Mm. He, can't, he did it, do you remember last season when he did it against United and he yeah. was like, we absolutely destroyed them in that first yeah. half. I don't, I don't see the problem. I mean, he is a 63 million pound Yeah, I know. Player. I know he is. But it's just, it just I don't know. It comes across a bit bitter to me. Um, Maybe, but, you know, Isaac probably cost more than a whole squad combined. Yeah, so. he did, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I completely get where he's coming from. I, I don't personally have a problem with that at all. Okay, fair enough. Well, with the, with the loss against Newcastle, it also ends our record of not losing after scoring first. Obviously, it was going to come to an end at some point, but it's still a massive achievement to go... 26 games unbeaten after scoring yeah. first, isn't it? I just think it shows the character and, you know, the squad is so... Even when we, um, we're losing games, you never feel like we're quite out of it. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that's what Thomas Frank has kind of instilled into the squad, that kind of belief that we can go to any game and, and get something. And if we're losing, um, you know, that belief, we can get back into it. Um, mm-hmm. So, yeah, I think that's it's a huge credit to Thomas Frank and his staff for what they've kind of done in terms of the psychology of the squad. Yeah, 100%. Um, you did want to talk a little bit about the atmosphere in the West End. Yeah, so yeah. Um, again, the atmosphere was very flat. 
Um, I don't know what it is about these 3 p.m. games. The, the, the fans just don't sing. Yeah, no. Like, around me, they like, just sing. It's not difficult. Like, <laughs> <laughs> like the players need our support. Mm-hmm. How many times have you heard Thomas Frank say in his pre-match interviews, we need the fans to back us all the way, and that doesn't happen. Mm-hmm. They deserve our support. We should not be where we are in the Premier League right now. Mm-hmm. You know, They deserve every bit of support they can get. Um, and yeah, it's just very flat. I, I really don't understand it. Like I was watching the Leeds game on Super Sunday and 5-1 down and the Leeds fans were still singing. But they're Leeds though. <laughs> they are Leeds, but I just feel like we got a, we got West Ham, which is basically our singing section. Yeah. Um, wh- why not back the boys? I just don't understand it at all. Um, mm. Maybe that's just because we've got loads of tourists now who obviously don't know the songs in chance. But um, yeah, just people around me who I see coming to every game, just just not getting involved. I understand, you know, like you're you're watching the game, you're you're seeing what's happening. But you know, I think people underestimate the role like we can have in the West End. Hundred percent. I remember the the last game that I can remember where there was a really good atmosphere was Fulham at home on a Monday night, and that was on a Monday night. Everyone was thinking it's going to be so flat. Obviously, I know it's Fulham, so there's there's a little bit extra in there. But I don't understand it either. It's it's weird, especially the three PM games. You'd think you'd think a home game against third in the league would get you up for it. Yeah. But it's it's weird. I, I mean, you go back to last season, Ben Chilwell calling like the stadium Hell on Earth or something. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I, I don't see why we can't recreate that every single week. Yeah, one hundred percent. I think it go, it's the same in away games as well. The the last away game where I can remember like properly that there was a really good atmosphere was Liverpool away last season. When yeah. we lost three yeah, nil, yeah. and it was just brilliant because every every fan was singing the whole time. Yeah, and it is you're right. It, it is a shame that we don't we can't replicate that at home, and we're starting not to replicate it away either. Um, I think our away support has been shocking for a while. Mm. Um, <laughs> so we're going on a bit here. We're going to get <laughs> slated. <laughs> I, I just think it's in a way they just back the boys. Just like it's not. You're not wrong. Like yeah, just support them. Mm-hmm. Um, they deserve our support. I, for me, I don't think we've had a good away end since the championship. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what it is, but uh, yeah, you know, it's one of those things, you know, being in the Premier League, mm. being a small club, we're going to attract these types of fans who yeah. come to games and don't really sing or chant. Or yeah. Uh, we'll move on to the away day section. Unless there's anything else you wanted to touch on from, from those two games? No? Sense. Away day section, you've got, you've got a game prepared for me. For anyone that doesn't know, away day is a segment of the podcast where we will name a game from in, in recent years and it is the other's task to name the goal scorers and the score that day. Uh, I can't remember the last one. We, the last one we did was Fulham last week because it was the anniversary of, of us trouncing them 4-1 at their place. But we've done it. We've done a couple in the past, but I believe it's over to me this week because I didn't do it last week. So what game have you got for me? So it was an FA Cup tie. Oh, God. Um, <laughs> back in, I want to say, 2019. Okay. Um, against a lower league club. And it was one of the funniest away ends I've been in. A, Barnet. <laughs> <laughs> Barnet, okay, yeah. the score. Oh, it wasn't. It wasn't five. Was it? It was five three. No. Oh, no. I could tell you. I could tell you who scored because I remember Morpay scored a penalty. Yeah, and they celebrated in front. Of and the they celebrated team. in front of the home. In front of the home fans, that was hilarious. Uh, who else scored? Watkins won a penalty by diving. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I can't remember. I can't remember what the score was. To be fair, three three. Three three. Yeah. So, oh, because it took it back to a replay. Yeah. Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. right. Okay. And um, that game, I just remember there was so much beef between Br- uh, Brentford and Barnet fans on Twitter, <laughs> and then um, like I, I don't get wound up over social media, but I was wound up. I don't know why. <laughs> and then um, I remember there was this guy Duncan. And he was like some Barnet fan who was just like absolutely um, triggering our group um, on Twitter. And then we bumped into him at the Griffin for the home game. And then uh, we kind of just spoke to him and were like, are oh, you right? <laughs> <laughs> and then he kind of had a, like, a pint with us. But yeah, no, that's what, that was a great away. I miss, I miss those FA Cup trips away to some League Two club. Mm. Well, I remember Port Vale was a really good one, yeah, that was good one last year. Who, who would you say is your ideal away trip on an on a FA Cup third round tie? <sighs> like, I love a non-league team away from home, mm. especially down south. I hate going up north. Mm. <laughs> Some, somewhere like Eastleigh would be good, I feel like. Yeah, no. Was it Eastleigh that we got beat by at home? No, we year. beat them. We beat them five. I think it was five. Who did we, who did we get beat at by home in the FA Cup? Maybe. Was it Wrexham, maybe? Did Wrexham mm. beat us 1-0 no. at one point? When? Way back. I can't I can't remember too much. Um, I, was, I was so young. But I, I just remember distinctly a League 2 or a non-league club beating us at home. 
um, 1-0, I think. I think it was Wrexham. I could have sworn it was Wrexham. Maybe I'm going to Google it. But actually, it might, it might have been Wrexham. It might not have been, but I might just be going down a rabbit hole. But yeah, FA Cup, FA Cup games against those kind of teams are so good. It feels like we haven't had one. Obviously, we had Port Vale last year. But, you know, what can you do? When, when Hampton we... Richmond away. <laughs> <laughs> no, that would be really good. <laughs> We'll, we'll move on then. So we got uh, a few questions from the GPG to ask. Um, one about posting threads on the GPG that I, that I won't get into. But uh, Aslan asks, how do you lot feel about the club treating long-standing fans as disposable? Obviously, this is referring to the racist, alleged racist incident in the Man United away end on Wednesday night. Um, when this news came out, I was understandably curious as to what had happened and then it transpires that there's been several comments back and forth on the GPG about the actual story um when it first when it first when it first came out I, I immediately thought to myself well if it's alleged that someone's done something mm. and it, it seems like a very strange story to make up like just on the surface it does you can't you can't say that going to go into the stewards and and saying that someone's spoken in a racist attitude given given you um spoken in a racist way towards you that's that's a very strange story to make up having said that if it gets proved that the guy is not guilty the guy that is accusing should get the same punishment as the guy as the accused if he was found guilty do you not think no 100 percent um I, th- I don't think you should accuse a long-standing brentford fan of racism but it's just it's just not on if if, mm. if that's the case mm. um but yeah, like I said, let's see what happens. Um, I don't think we know the full facts. Yeah, yet. exactly. I, I don't think we can we can because right now we're just speculating. It's just it's just his word against his word. So, but although I haven't seen anything from the from the guy that's accused him of, all I've all I've seen is those is those threads on the on the GPG. But yeah, we're, we're just we're just speculating at the moment. But like I said, if it gets if it gets found out that he's been lying, then I think he should give the same punishment. Uh, RAF Pato asked, did Eddie Howe show he can make it to elite levels of management with those half-time changes? Also asked what we would have done in Thomas Frank's situation in the second half. I think <clears throat> Eddie Howe is a very good manager. However, he's also spent millions and they've reshuffled their whole team since he's come in. Mm. And it, it's easy to be a very good manager when you've got very good players. Obviously, it's not easy. I'm just speaking on a podcast, but <laughs> it, it's comparatively easier to be a very good manager when you've got the weapons at disposal that he has like the, the overhaul that that team has gone through they've, they've basically changed their whole their whole squad yeah what do you reckon no i, I kind of disagree with you <laughs> <laughs> i think eddie howe is an unbelievable manager um obviously he took bournemouth from what league one to to the premier league but he i know they got relegated under him but he kind of set his own standards mm-hmm. there um and um, much of the squad is still the same um, when they had Steve Bruce in charge. Like, Miggy Almiron, you've seen him. Yeah, Miggy Almiron, but they've also got... Jacob Murphy was there. Um, I know they've spent quite a bit on Pope. Um, Pope, Botman, Botman Gamares, Trippier, Gamares, Isaac. Yeah. But, you know... <laughs> uh, I'm not saying he's a bad manager. Yeah. I'm just saying that we shouldn't get carried away with ourselves with how well Newcastle yeah. are doing when you when you consider how much yeah. they've spent. I highly recommend watching him on the High Performance Podcast done by Jake Humphrey. Yeah. Um, he spoke really well. Um, and just little things as well, how he got the squad to kind of gel when he came in. I, I really enjoyed it. And mm. That kind of opened my eyes and th- I thought, you know what, this guy, this guy's a great manager. Yeah, so. okay. Well, maybe I'll give it a listen. Uh, he also asked, what, what would we have done in Thomas Frank's situation in the second half? I think with the changes that Howe made, there wasn't like I think the main difference in that game was the fact that Wilson was pressing so high against our centre backs and they all triggered a press when whenever Wilson went. Whereas Isaac in the first half was a bit isolated. Um, so in terms of that, there's not there's not much you can do. Like, what do you do? Yeah. Swap out centre back? Which no, is we, when we're losing. No, yeah, no. Um, yeah, I think I don't think we could have done much differently. To be honest, I mm-hmm. think like I said, we deserve to get at least a draw out of the game. Um, and then Isaac's obviously quality finish that doesn't happen every week. Um, At the moment, it is for him. Did yeah, you see his goal against uh, Forrest the other week when he yeah, kind of yeah, like yeah. flicks it yeah, down? Yeah, quality. yeah, quality goal. But um, I think it's just unlucky. I, I, I think there's not much more we could have done. Um, I don't think Damsgaard came. No, on. he didn't. He didn't. I was gonna. I was gonna say we could have thrown on Damsgaard because he's he's better in the press in the midfield areas, but it's uh, Damsgaard. I, I don't know. Like I know Will hates him, but. <laughs> Has he has he done has he done enough? I I th- I've seen people talk about him becoming the new scapegoat of the team. It's not justified to make him a scapegoat because we have to remember it's his first season in English football. He's not as physically imposing as other players are in in the Premier League. Yeah. Do, do you think he's done enough to convince you this season? 
I I don't think I think he's shown glimpses, mm-hmm. but I think this time next year we're all going to be laughing. Yeah, and we're all going to be thinking to ourselves, why the hell did we think um, that a year ago? Because if you remember watching him at the Euros, mm-hmm. he was quality. Yeah, he's phenomenal. He was unbelievable, um, and that kind of ability it doesn't just go. Yeah, it, it's a lot of things. It's confidence. I read an interview with him the other day, um, and he said he lost like a ton of weight. Um, so it's all just about building up, building him up. He's still like what twenty two, twenty three. Mm-hmm. Um, he's got time on his hands. Uh, I think the Fulham game at home it kind of showed what he yeah. was about. Yeah. And I think in previous games we've kind of played him as a left winger, whereas I see him more as an eight and like a Jensen kind of kind of yeah. role. Yeah, but especially did, in the home game. Do you think he ousts Jensen from from that eight role? No, not at the moment, but in the future maybe. Mm-hmm. Um, I think like they both played um, alongside each other uh, Fulham at home and they're both great uh, I think it's just different games the home games probably play both of them mm. um, but yeah I think Damsgaard next season along with maybe Josh De Silva I think we'll start seeing the real the, the real players and yeah no I hope so because like you said that there has been there has been promising signs do you know who I think we missed against Brighton and United was Jan Elk because yeah. I think he with I think our what do you think our ideal what's your ideal midfield three at the moment? I think Jensen's Jensen's got to be there yeah, just Nor- with the form he's in and Norgard, Norgard as well. Yeah. So it's it's got to be either Jan Elk, Damsgaard, or De Silva. Yeah, out of those or three Baptiste. at the moment, not, or Baptiste as well. But you know we we spoke about Baptiste before. He never puts a foot wrong when he comes on. You know, apart from getting sent off, <laughs> <laughs> apart from getting sent off. The, but the thing is with Baptiste, he's just unlucky we're not in the championship. Because if he was in the championship, if we were in the championship. We'd st- we would be calling him like he would be one of our mm-hmm. best players um, I think he's just one of the unlucky ones um, now we're in the Premier League we have less games as well so when he does come in it's kind of you have to prove yourself then and then we don't have a game midweek where yeah. he can just like come off the bench or something um, and yeah we've got a lot of options but like I said let's just uh, the, the third player in midfield I, I, I have it's just dependent on which which game to be yeah. honest. Yeah, um, there's no set player. I don't think anyone's been outstanding enough to, to really. Apart from Jensen and, and Nor, you can't yeah. say Norgard. Like when Norgard's no, fit, Norgard yeah, plays. Yeah, hundred uh, percent. Dynamite asks, "What is the future of Pontus Janssen? And if we, if he thinks that we saw him play for Brentford the last time in a, in a Brentford shirt? Well, I hope not. Um, I think there was talk of him getting a, a, like a one year deal. Yeah, no, I saw that. Season. Yeah. Um, personally, I would take up that option. I, I would give him a one-year deal. Uh, I think we underestimate his kind of influence behind the scenes. We don't know what happens, but you know he's obviously a big character, mm-hmm. um, a leader, which is something like we massively lacked before he came in. And when we signed him, it kind of just changed the whole club. Yeah. Like that was a proper statement signing mm-hmm. signing him from Leeds. Um, can we upgrade? Yes, definitely. I think we can upgrade on yeah. most of our centre. Well, that's the thing. We've kind of we've kind of spoken about it on the pod before that out of the three centre halves, he's probably at the moment not. He's probably at the bottom of those three. Yeah. Pinnock, me, and Pinnock, me, and Janssen. So it's difficult. But it's like you said, all those things that he brings that aren't on the pitch that you can yeah. you can't really measure, yeah. like his leadership and stuff. So I hope it's I hope it's not the last time we see him in a Brentford shirt. Yeah. Um, because he also gives us an option whenever we whenever we decide to play in a five, you know, yeah, then yeah. then he becomes a central defender and Pinnock and me either side of him. Yeah. So yeah, I, I hope it's not the last time. I'm I'm not sure about him on the right of a of a back three. I mm. prefer him more central as like a kind of sweeper. Mm-hmm. Um, maybe it's just because I'm used to maybe Ayo being in that right centre back when he bombs forward, um, mm-hmm. and he can kind of play out of defence a bit better than Janssen. But yeah, I, I would keep Janssen, um, especially if we're g- uh, going to go on a European tour. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll move on to a, a preview for Wolves then. How are we, how we feeling about other game this weekend? I'm Another tough game. Yeah, yeah. I'm, um, I'm slightly nervous about it, to be honest. They won last time out against Chelsea. Yeah, um, again, going to Molyneux is just one of those games where it's... A <laughs> shit away end as well. Yeah, one, Worst honestly, away day in the country. <laughs> <laughs> They should give that little corner. I, I know, yeah, yeah. I don't, I don't know why. It's, it's so weird when they give you the whole of that yeah. middle tier in, in the yeah. middle. Yeah. So it, our atmospheres have been bad <laughs> as they are. But when you've got one set of fans singing over there and one set of fans mm. singing over there, it's just going to be difficult. Yeah. But yeah, back, back to the game. You're not, not feeling too confident. I think we could get a draw out of the game. I think um, they're not safe, but more or less safe. Mm-hmm. Um, I think they've got too much quality to go down. Yeah, and they've got a really good manager as well, Lopetegui. He's um, really experienced. And I just think... Yeah, it's just one of those games. Wolves away. You you never go into that game, even if you're like an Arsenal, or Man City. Like it's a it's a certain win. Hmm. 
Um, yeah, I think it'll be a tough game. They've got some, a few good players as well. Uh, Mateus Nunez. Scored, Jesus, yeah, oh, what a goal that was. Goal. Fucking hell. That was an unreal strike. <laughs> um, so, yeah, they, they won last time out against Chelsea. Only thing I'm probably looking forward to is because they play in a four. I think we might go back to a four, which I'm. I think we always look, just look a little bit more dangerous in a four. No. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, with Jansen out now, so I yeah, mean, we if we go into five, yeah. it'll probably be Zanka that gets slotted in. Zanka, yeah. I know everyone loves Zanka, and so do I. But he still just makes me a little bit nervous. Mm. But I don't know why. Um, but yeah, I would personally go with a four. Uh, hopefully, that's kind of a long-term formation. Um, when we've been off the back three, but yeah, <coughs> yeah, let's just um, yeah, we'll see. What yeah, I think it'd be a good battle between Ben Mee and Costa. I remember in the reverse fixture, Costa actually had quite a lot of joy that game. I remember he had a chance right towards the end of the game where he probably should have scored. Yeah. Right now, I put it right. I think it was in our six-yard box, mm-hmm. but I think he just hits it straight to Haya. Yeah. Well, they have a few options because they signed Cunha from Atletico. Yeah, and, and they've got they've Huang He Chan Huang, on, the, on the bench. Raul Jimenez. Yeah. Um, so yeah, they've got options. That's what I mean. They've got way too much quality to go down when you think of all the forwards that you just mentioned. They've got Adama Traore doesn't even start, but you know, Adama Traore is a <laughs> very, very debatable player in terms of his quality. Quality in Middlesbrough, though. <laughs> yeah, quality in Middlesbrough in the Championship. Yeah. <laughs> But yeah, no, there's there's definitely going to be some good battles on on the weekend. I I hope for a draw, only because I think we will draw. Only because I remember in the reverse fixture there was pretty much nothing to separate the two teams. It was a stinker of a game. Um, but yeah, I'm I'm hoping for a draw. But at the same time, it's just a difficult place to go, and there's no easy places to go in the Prem apart from apart from a few towards the bottom end like Southampton. Yeah. Yeah. But <clears throat> you know. We'll see. We'll see. The Elam Road podcast will be back following the game against Wolves where we'll hopefully chat about a point gained or three points gained and we'll also preview the six-pointer against Villa at home the next week in terms of Europe. Sounds good. Yeah? Yeah. (laughs) Cheers. We'll see you next week. Cheers.